Assalamualaikum. Good day. Hello. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to today's program, Distinguished Lecture Series number 104, but the first in 2021, brought to you live by Faculty of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia, UTM. My name is Aini Zura Abdul Kadeh from School of Mechanical Engineering. I will be the host for today's program. I am happy and delighted to inform that we will have a very well-known professor in the area of manufacturing engineering, Professor Yauni Partanen from Mechanical of Engineering Department, Alto University, Finland, all the way from Finland. Okay, so today, uh, Professor Yauni will be giving a very interesting um, topic, a lecture topic entitled Digital Spare Parts. But before that, I would like to share on how I actually meet Professor Yauni. It happened about a year ago almost a year ago, where I had this unexpected opportunity uh, from a Horizon 2020 research grant under reset program headed by Dr. Fuad together with two of my other colleagues, Mr. Hide and Dr. Azlan, where we were invited to be part of a guest uh, researcher, uh, a one-month attachment in Alto Department, Alto University, uh, Marine Technology Department, and we spent a very interesting time over there doing discussion, uh, gather a lot of uh, data. Uh, uh, we make a lot of lab visits and also networking activities with Professor Yauni's team. So today we have him back here in this program and I, I'm happy to see him on in online webinar session into this program. So without further delay, I would like to invite uh, our Dean, Dr. Professor uh, Dr. Rafiq, uh, to formally invite and also introduce Professor Yauni's background. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, Dr. Aini Zura. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome everyone to our 104th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering, University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Yauni Partanen from Aalto University, Finland. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Professor Paratanen has a full-time professorship at Alto University in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. For his doctoral degree, he studied laser physics. He is an academic scientist and an experienced high technology industry leader, 15 years in product development, advanced research, production, and product management. Dr. Yauni Paratanen was a key equipment developer for 3D systems in California with more than 50 patents. That's five zero. 50 patents issued in the most important technology markets, the leading AM technology company in the world. In addition to leading his own research and development teams at 3D systems, Dr. Paratanen personally did most of the laser and optical engineering needed for products during 12 years with the company. He is named as an inventor in more than 50 patents issued internationally in the most significant high technology markets. In addition to technical responsibilities, Dr. Paratanen worked closely with Chuck Hull, the founder of 3D Systems, on new business development. Professor Paratanen's academic career spans from university and research laboratory positions in Finland, England, and California. He has published in leading international science journals like Nature and Physical Review Letters. He has more than 3,700 citations with a H index of 36 from Google Scholar. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Yauni Partanen from Aalto University, Finland, with a lecture on digital spare parts. Professor Partanen, over to you. Okay, thank you very much for kind introduction and thank you for letting me be in this, this lecture series and, and, set, and giving some of my background or some of my recent research to all, all of the listeners uh, for this lecture. Also, yes, so let, uh, let me go to my presentation. Uh, so I'm gonna be start sharing the screen. Uh, Okay, 
So let's see. Uh, I do have the. So I'm assuming you are. Let me go one step back. I assume you are seeing my starting screen. Yes, Prof. We can see your screen. Okay. Thank you very much. So, and I, I'm assuming you can hear me well. Yes, the sound is good as well. Okay, very good. Uh, and and uh, happy New Year to everyone. I can't do that in any other language except in Finland. So, hyvää uutta vuotta kaikille. So, so that was in Finnish. The happy New Year. So, uh, yes. So I will all. I will in this starting screen i have a couple of pictures about my background which was already explained in 3d printing like uh, so i have developed 3d printers i many of these systems have lasers and originally i started to be kind of uh, in very much involved in in dealing with and and figuring out how to use lasers in 3d printing however eventually i also ended ended in other aspects of the technology so basically mostly i am a laser sorry i'm am a 3d printing equipment developer but then business aspects this is probably this presentation is more about business aspects so so a business aspect has also been very very keen to me and i i was i was uh, i was very fortunate to work with the great uh, industrial management professor uh, to, to kind of been able to develop this some business concepts related to this you're going to see. Here you see a couple of first examples of 3D printing in production. And, and I was uh, fortunate to be involved in both of these. One is, one is technology which has been developed by Invisalign. So these invisible feed aligners, we are not going to talk anything about that in this presentation. But then there is a second is this kind of uh, uh, cool inducting uh, for for upgrades in 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 fighter jets and actually this, 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 i'm going to be talking a little bit more about that and i was fortunate to be involved in developing that this is for, was application by boeing so anyway so let's move ahead a few words about alta university so alta university is a new university started uh, started 2010 actually i joined Helsinki University of Technology 2009, half a year before the start of Aalto University. So it's a very new university. However, it has a long history. Uh, so it was university made by joining uh, three different universities. So it was Helsinki University of Technology. That's actually uh, where I come from and where my original background, where I did my PhD and all my degrees, so it was Helsinki University of Technology. It started already 1849. Then it was joined by Helsinki University of Art, Art and Design, so, and then Helsinki School of Economics. And actually, this combination is rather unique in the world. So we have art, design, science, and and business in the same university. And that's that's a that's a uh, was a rather unique combination in the world. And and the university started 2010. 2010, we were the, the three universities were in different locations, and and we we then we started the process of combining them all into the same location. All of them were where they were about 10 kilometers away. Uh, 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 two of them in Helsinki, one on the side of Espo, which is a kind of suburb of Helsinki, and Otanium is in Espo, and now all the all the original universities are in Espo. So second thing, joining these three universities, it's important to kind of uh, what we decided in the, in the management of the university, uh, we decided to have not just three different schools, different, uh, different units below the university level are, are called schools, but we decided to have about the same size schools. So so because the technical university was so much bigger, we actually have now four school in the technical field. And then we have school of arts and design school and then school of business. So the school of engineering where I come from is doesn't 
cover all the engineering discipline. It doesn't cover electrical engineering or chemical engineering, and it doesn't uh, cover the basic science. We have school of science. So let's move now to the to the to my specific talk today or my lecture today. So what are digital spare parts? So digital spare parts is actually a concept where where uh, where we are not really uh, we, we are actually keeping the information about the spare part in a digital form and we only produce the spare part uh, when when we need it so typically in in, in modern manufacturing uh, you while you are making the way making the initial initial version of the products you also make huge number of spare parts because the original product could be in the other side of the world and you want to have the spare parts close by. So therefore, you need to have really big warehouses. However, with the digital spare part concept, you have only digital warehouse. No real hardware is distributed all over the world. So. Uh, so the concept is you you manufacture your spare part only when you need it. Uh, uh, so therefore, and, and I think which was really important aspect that you manufacture it, for example, by 3D printing, but you manufacture typically close to customer. So, so, so there is a significantly less logistics needed with digital spare parts old-fashioned logistics where you transport material across the world. So, so this is the concept of digital spare parts. So why? Why, uh, why would you do digital spare parts? First of all, obviously, you, you don't need these enormous warehouses. Uh, if, if you can have all of your spare parts digital, the, the, the reduced inventory and the cost related to reduced inventory it can be enormous. Certainly, in the case of very old products, where you might not even, uh, it might be very, very difficult to get a spare part. But but, but when you when when you uh, when you save the digital information related to the spare uh, spare part, then you can you can use it for example three D printing to make it. Then there is there is also a a second certainly in cases where where you have a product which are not very very much uh, in use, you, you, you might have, you might need to wait the spare part for a long time. It might need to come from the other side of the world or it might need to be re-engineered. So when you have a digital spare part, you, you can have a faster service, less down. And then there is a, a additional potential. You might have also smart digital spare parts. So the spare part might have information, for example, queer monitoring. So, so it knows how much uh, useful life it has. We will, we will describe that a little bit later. And then there is also a, uh, a, a possibility for product inf identification. And we, uh, we, when we talk about digital twin, this is something which I come back, back a little bit later as well. And then there is an opportunity for product upgrades. So let's move now to the to the kind of our, my research in this field. So originally we worked on on the concept of women. 3D printing was kind of uh, uh, we knew 3D printing, but certainly the production applications of 3D printing were not very prominent in, in about 10 years ago, a little bit more than 10 years ago. So we, we actually worked on the idea. I'm not sure if we were the first one who were really kind of pushing in the direction of the digital spare part. But here is the kind of the concept of digital spare parts. So on the left-hand side, you have a conventional conventional spare part. So you have, on, you have uh, OEM uh, making product, then they, then they ship the spare parts to local warehouses and then the, uh, the local warehouses ship the spare parts to the service center and then from the service center you, you take the spare parts to the customer. When you have a digital spare part, 
the OEM possibly, or someone else like we talk a little bit later, but the OEM possibly has uh, has only the spare part information, digital form, and it can email or, or, or place it to somewhere where the where the service center can find it, and service center can then print the spare part. So as you can see here, the logistic chain can be dramatically simple. So this is something which we published around 2010, and it, it has actually received around 350 to 400 citations already, this, this, this paper. Then 2014, we worked on the concept that actually, the, like I said, this is the concept which I worked around 2000, uh, the, one of the first real production engineer, pro, production application of 3D printing uh, was uh, was this kind of upgrade of uh, of uh, uh, Hornet uh, Super Hornet a, a Hornet fighter plane into the Super Hornet and there was a question of how can you cool the additional electronics uh, electronics what you need so so we thought that this is already where the production application is with 3D printing so therefore this could be a prime candidate for for uh, digital spare parts. So we did the analysis. I knew that I knew the numbers for this very well, and we did a real mathematical analysis of of what it would make, what it would cost to have the uh, the spare parts produced digitally at the site. And we did. We came with the with the numbers on the right hand side. You see these bar charts that because because the equipment used for this application. The, the, it's very expensive, so the equipment cost stands out to be so high that that having a local production is prohibitive from the cost point of view. I'm going to get back to this later in in, in the later analysis. But here you also see that that we, we did the case uh, the scenario three and four are the scenario where we assume that the production cost. But the production equipment cost is significantly lower. So then, actually, it turned out to be even less uh, less expensive to use spare part concept at location. So uh, and and actually, the cost of 3D printing equipment is going going down all the time. So we do we do see that this is a spare part. We did calculate that that and that it it, it certainly is a Real, real potential in the future, and this publication was published in 2014, and it has around 600 citations already. Okay, so then now let's get to the project which was called Digital Spare Part. So this project started 2016. It has two phases, and we are now finished. We now finished uh, finished even the second phase. This presentation is more, most mostly about the first phase of that project. So let me start with an animation uh, about this project. So in this animation, we kind of describe what's the benefit of digital spare part.
Okay, so so that was kind of the animation had a lot of features which 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 we are have been studying in this project. So the first uh, first let's talk about the challenges uh, or issues with digital spare parts. So the first challenge is that actually typically manufacturing cost is is uh, in 3D printing significantly higher than compared for injection molding or, or some other techniques or 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 of foundry technology. So the second is quality, warranty, liability, intellectual property protection, availability of 3D printing, manufacturing data, and then then actually the, the business model is something which I which I'm going to finish this presentation. But so all those issues, I, I don't think I have time to go all of them through. But I will come go through many of them. To kind of describe you what kind of what are you dealing with when you are talking about digital spare parts okay so let's go to the manufacturing cost so this is something which we which i use a lot in my in my lectures about about when, when i'm talking about 3d printing as a production method compared to conventional so basically on the on the on the vertical axis you you see a, pr a price per part with the tech, with, with with technology, and then on the on the on the horizontal axis here, you have the num how many how many parts you need to make, and and what you see the yellow curve sorry the, the green curve here is a conventional technology. So basically, with the conventional technology, for example, if you make plastic parts, you need to use injection molding. To to, to make the mold costs typically tens of thousands of dollars or euros. So, so even if you make one single part, you still need to make the mold, and so the cost of the one single part is ten thousand euros. Or, or, but then if you make hundred of those, the price goes dramatically down. So you see the curve shape here. So the number of parts affects the cost per part. With three D printing, we don't have this kind of uh, curve. Typically. Uh, typically, the cost is is high. It's, it's not high for one part, but it becomes much much higher for many parts. So so there is this kind of break even quantity for for and and that's a very important important concept when you when we think about 3D printing and and digital spare parts as well. Uh, but there certainly for spare parts, you typically need one. That's why that's why we are. We are in here, but typically we might have the mold or already. So therefore, therefore uh, it's more complicated. But but then you have a lot, lot long travel, long transportation costs and 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 time related costs. But anyway, so this is one uh, manufacturing cost is one issue. We did as part of this project, we we kind of developed this kind of uh, software which was looking the part, the shape of the part. And, and it estimated what's going to be the cost to 3D print it. And, 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 and we, this is actually now commercially available. One of my, one of my doctoral students uh, has made this, uh, has started a company to sell, uh, sell this, this uh, uh, not this product, but this analysis process. And, and, and it's, it's, it's electronically available. So, so, so one, so, uh, so here we have this is one of the item in our project which we did the sec uh, the second now second kind of real significant item is that how many uh, how many parts you can really 3d print because practically most of the 3d printers only use one single material one single material so typical parts has a lot of electronics a lot of components a lot of uh, areas with different materials and those kind of things so so for that aspect, we did we did look to the, the kind of the inventory list of two different companies, and 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 we analyzed very quickly. So in one case, we had about 200,000 200, components or spare or spare parts, and the other one we had about 10, 20,000 spare parts. And and the typical. So first of all, you need we need to figure out. Uh, what can be technically phase two? What can be technologically possible to print? Print the, the phase three is how many of those? So typically, technology 
that these spare parts were in the range of 20% or 25%. Uh, the, uh, how many can uh, are technically feasible, not possible, feasible, it makes sense to print them. And now we get into the five to five to six percent range. And and then what is even technologically and economically feasible? And now we get into the range of one to two percent. But I, I think even there is an enormous potential if you look one to two percent of all dif different parts that can be three D printed and would be three D printed. So so that's so ne next item which I want to talk is to which we already saw in the in the in the animation uh, potential small smart digital spare parts. So there is this wear monitor, monitoring which were kind of uh, described in the in the in the in the in the, uh, in the smart digital spare parts. But now I want to talk about the other aspect of this thing, and this aspect is. The concept of digital twin. Digital twin is not only digital spare parts, but digital twin is all modern technologies. Companies are going into the digital twin. So the data, the the, the, the individual components or even 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 parts, they uh, they generate data all the time. They can they, they have production data. They have also uh, um, um, they have. Uh, uh, usage data, all that can be saved, and it can nowadays. It's it's it. It could be saved if you put some intelligence into the part. You can save it ins inside the part. But actually, what is very easy nowadays, it can can be saved in the cloud. So so saving them in the cloud. There is a simple. So so the, the fundamentally in a digital twin com component, you are saving. The, the production, the original the data for this individual component, and you are saving the wear and 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 uh, usage data for this individual component in the cloud. And typically, then this is available wherever you need to service your equipment. Even if you change the part to a different location, this data can be can be retrieved from the cloud. And and so the only thing you need. For for digital twin, you need a some kind of some kind of identification, individual identification, which is then then provided to the uh, provided to the to the to the to the twin to the digital twin in the cloud. And and we did experiments where we used different three D printing or additive manufacturing technologies, material extrusion. We put in RFD uh, RFD RFID identification tags, stereolithography, select, select, select laser sintering, all these things we demonstrated that you can you can you can integrate RFID tags into the system. So let's move move ahead to a, why another uh, kind of potential product upgrade. So so even with old products, with digital spare parts, the digital spare part can be better than the original spare part. So while you are developing your technology further, you can upgrade uh, upgrade the products, and new products can have that new upgrade already. Or new uh, digital spare part can have that new upgrade included. So typically, quite often we talk about topology optimization in aerospace industry. This is very important because you can reduce the the, the uh, weight of individual components. So here is an example of a kind of standard example pro bracket, which on the left hand side you see the original conventional manufacturer bracket, and on the right hand side you see the digital uh, digi uh, 3D printed bracket, which takes all the forces of what is needed for this product, but it's significantly lighter and 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 has an impact in the in the in the energy consumption of that airplane. So, and and we did study few examples where we are reducing cost through mass reduction. Actually, 3D printing the, the typically the cost of 3D printed component. Is directly proportional to the weight of that 3D printed component. So therefore, uh, cost uh, mass reduction 
already uh, already is beneficial from 3D printing point of view. So here are a few examples we studied in the in the in the, in the project. So let me finish with the final concept. Let me finish my my lecture with the final concept. And this is the business models. And this is actually a really really interesting aspect because because it it really this 3D printing offers opportunities for for companies to kind of be, be relieved of three of, of kind of ser, uh, spare part uh, uh, spare part production or relieved of, of even dealing with spare parts because if we look to op different kind of business models what could be involved in 3d uh, 3d print, printing spare parts for example on the top left hand corner we have the business model for ever everything is included into the business business uh, environment of the of the of the original OEM company and then on the right hand side on the right bottom corner of the right hand side it is the op uh, the, the exactly opposite case where actually the OEM after it has produced the original product doesn't take any responsibility of providing spare parts it gives out the designs, give out it even to the customer and customer itself. This might be a business, this customer, and they can order the, the 3D printable spare parts uh, in, in for, uh, for themselves. And then there are three different kind of business models or networks uh, in, in which, which where, where there are different player who is taking the responsibility uh, between the OEM and, and the end user. So this is actually to me this is the one of the things because typically typical in typical application the printing is 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 available 3D printing is is not pr produced by the OEM or is not produced by the end user it's produced by service bureau uh, independent in, in, uh, independent service provider. So therefore, and, and typically these kind of business models already are very strongly present in 3D, 3D printing world. Okay, so I think that that, that was what, all what I wanted to discuss. I want to acknowledge, first of all, my own research group. Uh, Mika Salami is, is a, uh, so this is a 3D manufacturing group in Alta University, Mechanical Engineering Department. Mika Salami is a, uh, is a uh, um, staff scientist in my group. Sergei Sekurov is a postdoc. I have a couple of other postdocs already uh, also. Uh, then I want to also acknowledge this, my partner uh, organization in the 3D DIVA project, digital spare part project, Pasipuk and Cinemexa Cortalainen were the, the most uh, relevant scientists in that project. And then I want to and acknowledge the original research in the in the three D printing of spare parts, which I was done with uh, with the professor Jan Holmström, logistic research group of Alta University. I thank you very much for your interest, and I'm open to questions uh, if if you happen to have one. So let me let me try to figure out how do I give the control back to back to I think Aini is probably the one who is gonna so let's see if I yes Sorry. yeah let, let, let's see I'm Thank stop sharing now interesting, uh, talk, uh, very talk. Informative and also very interesting animation so yes. to audience if you have any question I would like to invite you uh, to post it your questions to Professor Yauni No, maybe I can start with uh, my own question. Okay, uh, you mentioned about the four issues related to the digital spare parts, but I'm just uh, wondering about your comments on probably two additional uh, factors that can contribute to the issues. One might be the cybersecurity, in which I think when we put everything digital and available, especially manufacturing models online, so cybersecurity might be one of them. The second one, I'm just wondering whether there's a need of a 
standards or formal standards to formally uh, formally introduce or formally design the information or knowledge of that digital model? Is there a necessity for that particular uh, specific standard for that? So I'm just wondering about your comments on these yeah. two issues. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic question. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly, uh, cybersecurity is one aspect of it. Also, the intellectual uh, intellectual property protection it's a huge aspect. And 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 then there is related to this is the liability as well. So who is liable of of, of the of if, if if something goes wrong with the digital spare part? So. So there, there are many, many, many additional issues, which, 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 which. So that's why, that's why there were so many different potential business models. So yeah. it's, the, it's, it's, it, it. What, what are the? But, but I think these are, to me, they are issues, but they are also opportunities. So, so company can say that okay, yes, we don't take any liability if anyone else puts anything like that, and then it's, then it's left for the user. And, and certainly it's not that simple, but what I'm saying is that it is, but this is the future. So I, I think the, uh, the technology allows us that. Uh, then there is obviously when you, when you are sending the data about your product to be manufactured by a, by a third party, you are always, there's always kind of security issues of your product, your own ownership and those kind of things. So yes. Absolutely, very, very, very central issues. And actually, uh, I have been involved with, with 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 lawyers in other projects where we are studying. We actually wrote a book about these kind of aspects related to 3D printing, not only digital spare parts. And 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 so there there is a, there is there is this book available where where where, where, where there were about 15 experts. Of writing different aspects related to that. Okay. So then the sorry, the second question. Say it again. <laughs> uh, second question is basically related uh, to standardization. Is there a yes, need good. of formal yeah. standards to really yes. uh, document the yes. knowledge online? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I know standardization is a huge as huge element as well. So so basically, we are uh, certainly. There is, a, if you don't use your 3D equipment correctly, you might get a very bad quality parts. So therefore, you need some kind of certification that this, certainly without kind of certification that this part will work, uh, it, it might be useless. So, so therefore, it might not even work in your application. So the standardization is an enormous uh, aspect of all of this. There are many uh, organizations developing standard. There is ASTM America. Uh, I don't remember oh, you, um, American version of the standard development, and then there is a European uh, version of standard development. And I'm sure there these are all getting into. So we, there are now about, about if I remember right, there are five six different sets of standards already for 3D printing, and all those are very relevant for digital spare parts. I see. Okay, thank you, Professor Professor Yaudi, for your uh, very informative answer. Uh, any more question from the audience? Probably one or two more questions. No. I think nothing from the audience. Your so. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Yogi, for the very interesting uh, sharing uh, to all of us. Okay. So, all right. So, there's one. Okay. From Professor Adnan Hassan. He's an academician in uh, mechanical engineering department. Can you elaborate about 4D and yes. 5D printing? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you. I do see the. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, uh, to be honest, I'm a little bit puzzled about the 5D. I know what 4D is. However, uh, mm -hmm. generally, those are very, very interesting concepts. However, we are talking about rather small subset of potential applications from my perspective. So I think 3D, 3D printing, uh, certainly there is a huge, huge potential uh, application field. I think 4D printing is very interesting. 
the scientifically absolutely fabulous field to study. But I, I still think that I haven't really, really kind of find uh, a, a kind of volume application for 4D where I, I mean, something like, 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 like cardiac stent, which is, which is a kind of thing which could be a, could be a 4D application. But, but I, I, I'm, that could actually, I, I'm involved in one of the similar kind of research projects, but we didn't really get anywhere in terms of real practical applications. But then again, um, could someone help me with the 5D printing? I'm, I'm not familiar what, you, what people mean with that. <laughs> Okay. All right. From Akmal Hashim Sham, yeah. any future of 3D printing in health industry? Yes. Like yes. Yeah. Yes. There, there, yes, there are certainly a lot of, uh, we do, uh, one of my colleagues, Mika Salmi, he, he, was in, he was involved in his PhD work. Uh, this, uh, the, the, he was doing implants, uh, uh, sorry, uh, titanic implant. Uh, so that's what he was developing for his uh, PhD work, titanic implants are, are, are commercially available, uh, 3D printable titanic in, in, titan, impl, implants are really common already uh, in many, many applications. Obviously, you can do, you can do, uh, so these are actually some kind of human spare parts. So, mm. so the bones are, bones are 3D printed exactly in the optimal con configuration. And, and certainly this is already commercially available in many, many uh, uh, hospitals in the world. And, and there are other kind of, we, we are working on, on the idea, idea of kind of uh, slow release uh, materials for, for, for medicine. Uh, certainly having shapes which kind of, which kind of reduces the re release rate of, of medicine. Uh, so this could go, with, for example, with the implants. So, so a lot of potential applications in the in the medical field, and and certainly medical field is something which is which is which is very strong in the three D printing world. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank I think much. that's all about the question from the audience. All right. Thank you, Professor Yaolin for the very interesting sharing of uh, the topic. And I think uh, if you have any more potential questions or you think you can, you want to collaborate with probably Alto, I think I can be the key person uh, because we still have ongoing collaboration going on. So thank you, Prof. Uh, and uh, hope to see you guys in the next BLS series. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you. Certainly, I would have preferred to be on uh, in 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 uh, in space there already. So, but no, this remote this remote lecture was fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Aini, uh, for moderating the session and for introducing Professor Yauni Partanen to me. Uh, and to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Yauni Partanen. Thank you so very much first for accepting our invitation to speak at our distinguished lecture series and secondly for a great sharing session. Uh, just to let you know that uh, I'm working on implant as you mentioned just now and yes of course uh, you know during my PhD years you know that they, they produce using uh, a conventional manufacturing methods but nowadays everything is, uh, is 3D printing and uh, so uh, wish all of you uh, the best uh, and especially in Finland, uh, I heard from Prof. Yauni before this webinar that it is snowing in Finland. So it is uh, good to know that uh, it snows again. Uh, <laughs> I have been to Finland, uh, so hopefully one day I will have the time uh, to spend some time at Alto University and meet you and your colleagues doing some 3D bioprinting. So, uh, and to yes. all of our viewers worldwide, thank you for watching Distinguished Lecture Series. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye. Thank you and bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye.